gentlemen, good afternoon and happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. It is good to yes, see sir. you guys. How's the week been? Roger, I can't hear you very well. How is that now? Any better? Yes, that's a lot better for me anyway. I don't know about Dr. Henry. Good to see you, Doc. You can, yep, I can, I, can, I can hear you, Raj. Listen, this has been a trying week. My heart goes out uh, for those in the state of Texas. Oh, yeah. Uh, wow. The, yeah, power outages, the, the ice storm, and, the, you know, my, my definitely, definitely my heart goes out for them, uh, praying yeah. that things will get better there. And for a lot of the people in our nation as well. Yeah, yeah. True, Listen, true. It, it's I, sometimes I feel guilty, Raj, uh, down here in Fort Lauderdale, uh, <laughs> <laughs> with, with all, all these uh, coconuts and palm trees and sunshine. Um, but listen, don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. Don't yeah, feel guilty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because, because uh, you know, in Texas, you know, if it wasn't for this, they would be enjoying the same weather. But that does not mean that we downplay what they're going through. It is sad. But um, we want them to know that we're praying for them and whatever we can do yes. to help. Um, just send us a note here at the Pastors Roundtable. We are willing to do what we can to help you there in Texas. Yeah. We do appreciate that. Well, hey, look, on a higher note, uh, we got Faye Davis with us today, you guys. I see her in the chat. We want to welcome Miss Faye. Uh, she is here uh, week after week. I see Lulu. Uh, I, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that last name, but she is joining us from Texas. Um, yeah. We want to welcome you, uh, Lulu. Let me get this up here and pull this down so everybody can see that. Lulu is joining us from Texas. Um, we see uh, Jennifer Sharon in the chat, uh, staple oh. here. Um, welcome yeah. to Dr. Rock. Um, Ann King is watching. Ann Petty King. We see Roycelyn from Maryland. Um, Coretta Phillips from, is also praying for Texas. She wants everybody to know that. Um, and um, what am I seeing here? I'm seeing Happy Sabbath from West Palm Beach, Florida as well. So, so many of you are joining us today and, and there are many more. We want you to go ahead in the chat. Let us know where you are joining us from. Um, if you're in Texas, if you're in California, if you're in Florida, if you're in New York, if you're somewhere out of the country, we want to know that you are watching. So just drop that in the chat. Somebody's going to say hello to you and greet you today. One other thing we need you to do right now, Dr. Henry, you had came through for me last week. What are we going to ask them to do? Oh, are we going to ask them to subscribe and share? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Subscribe and share. So share, share, share. You know, one of the ways that we get our message out is because of you. In fact, you are the way. And so if you could just continue to share, share this feed with your family, friends, your groups, and I know that uh, by God's grace, uh, they'll be blessed and we'll get more support for what we're doing. You know, what we're doing here is just having uh, conversations, having information that we can bring uh, to our viewers so that all of us can be informed and then make a call to action. And that call to action is based on what the Lord has inspired for you to do. So again, share, 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 and then share. Amen. All right. Yeah. Hey, before we get started, you know, we, we, we had some sad, you know, we, we were talking about the, the storms there in Texas and, you know, actually even in Nashville and, and in, in certain areas that don't normally have cold snow, they, they're taking it bad this today. But um, we also want to remember um, a colleague of mine, a colleague of ours, really, um, yes. Pat Dwayne Thomas, he passed away on, the, on last night, he and his family, and, and we, our heart just goes out to him. And so uh, here at the Pastors Roundtable, we want to say uh, to Joy and to the kids, um, we are praying for you and um, we, thank, uh, we thank God for the opportunity we had to uh, minister with, uh, yes. with Dwayne and he's, he was just a likable person. Wait, you mean um, Tennessee? I'm sorry. I yes. Tennessee? Dwayne? Yes. He was in Memphis, yes. yes. Yes, he um, yeah. passed away this yeah. morning. So let's let's remember them, and you know, as we as we move forward, and look forward to that day when Jesus comes, we can be reunited together. Oh wow! Ah. Y'all can't throw that stuff at, at us on on air. <laughs> oh, oh I'm goodness. sorry. I thought you knew. No, just <laughs> you know? I did not know. Yeah. Did not know. Okay. 
is a classmate of Mars at, at Oakwood. Yeah. And wow, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry to hear that. All right. But well, as you know, as, as you know, this month is um, is Black History Month. Yes. And uh, we here at the Pastors Roundtable wanted to connect uh, Black History. Um, obviously, um, I always say this. Uh, I heard a preacher tell me this. You know, uh, every time he looks in the mirror, it's Black History. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, but but we want you to know that uh, we're we're taking this very seriously. Um, in terms of acknowledging what uh, African Americans in particular and uh, ethnic groups have done to make this country great. And, uh, you know, all of it has not been great. All of it hasn't been good, but, you mm -hmm. know, we still have to acknowledge it. And I think um, we're going to we're going to do a little bit of that today. Yes. Yes. That brings us to what's on the table for today. Dr. Henry, what's on the table, my friend? All right. Um, you want me to tell you who's at the table? Okay. Yes. Or so, what's so, on the okay. Table? So let's do this. Let's. Hey, Roger just told us what's on the table. Who's at okay. the table, Doctor Henry? Who's at the table today? Well, let's get there. Well, listen. We are just so blessed to have uh, one of, I think, one of the church's greatest leaders, uh, one who has the the perspective and experience that not many people have, and that is in the person of Doctor. Calvin B. Rock. He served as president of Oakwood University. Mm -hmm. He also served as a vice president for the General Conference. He also served as chair of the Loma Linda University and Loma Linda University Medical uh, Center. And he wow. is just has a wealth of knowledge. Uh, he is a pastor or was a pastor too at the Bethany Church in particular in Miami, Florida. And the author, the author of this book here, I know we're probably gonna put on the screen, but right here, the author of this book right here, Protest and Progress. If you don't have this book, you gotta get it because this gives you vital information on what has happened in our history. And it also is a motivating tool uh, on, on what we can do now. Um, and so I have a copy, been reading this thing and uh, just, just such a blessing. So again, Dr. Calvin Roth, just so privileged to have him on the show today. All right. Well, we're going to just uh, bring him on now. We're going to decrease. And there we are, Dr. Rock. It is a privilege and a pleasure for us to have you with us, sir. Um, I'm going to give you just a quick minute after after uh, uh, who pray. I, I'm going to offer a quick word of prayer, and then I'm going to give you just a few seconds to say whatever you'd like to say to whoever you'd like to say it to. But let's pray, Father. We invite you into this place and into this space, even now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, what a joy! Amen. What a joy, Dr. Rock. It is to have you have you with us. We know we didn't give your full resume and all of the many different things. And so what we normally do at the beginning, we give our guest and we just pick a number. Um, I'm just going to pick a number. What shall I do? I'm going to give you 49.783 seconds to just say whatever you want to say um, to whoever you'd like to maybe fill in some stuff. And I'm playing with the time. You take the time you want, but just a greeting to our guest. I see uh, uh, Pastor Gary Thurber is with us today. One of our former guests, president of the Mid-America Union. Good to have you with us today, yes. uh, Elder Thurber. Well. But Dr. Rock, the time is yours. Thank you, gentlemen. What a pleasure and what a delight to see how the Lord is using, using you young Turks, young Turks. <laughs> so that uh, we, we older, we older fellows <laughs> and some ladies as well can, can rejoice in seeing how the Lord is using you. This is a wonderful thing you're doing. Uh, my first time really being knowledgeable, let alone being on. But uh, I want to congratulate you for what you're doing. I do see a number of names here, uh, some of whom I know, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. So I won't take a lot of time with, with, with that kind of thing, but I'm ready when you are. All right. And, and let me just say this, you know, um, this this program here is just going to be a special program. Ansel, just if you could walk us through this program. You know, when you have Dr. Rock coming on, uh, you, you know, we just got to do something special. <laughs> got to do something special. So, because he has a lot of vital information yeah. that I know that we want to share with our viewers and ourselves. So, Pastor Paul, we kind of walk them through 
Okay, so, so this is a little different. Need, again, one more, one more thing I need everybody to do is, is to share this stream. Um, now, we're doing something today that technological, uh, from the technical side, we haven't really done a lot of before. So if I mess this up, it's my fault. You blame Pastor Paul as far as this sharing the screen and trying to make this work because Dr. Rock is going to take us through a presentation. And he's going to have some slides, but I need you to invite somebody right now because you want to make sure that everybody gets to hear that in just a few moments. But I want to set this scene as we're setting this up. Dr. Rock, when I got to, when I became of age and heard your name, you were the president of Oakwood University. Um, and at that time, you were a legend for your memory. You seem to, everybody always say, Dr. Rock remembers faces and names. Um, and, I, and I was, and, and they just, I'm going to be honest, they, they made you a, a superhero that I just thought was not realistic. Um, I don't remember the year, but my father, uh, Oster Paul, O.H. Paul, was the speaker one year at, at Oakwood Alumni, and I had to be about 10 or 11, somewhere, maybe 7 or 8 even at that time. And we went to your house to eat dinner that Sabbath. And Muhammad Ali was there at your house with us when we ate yes. dinner. And so again, I must have been in about second or third grade, which means I was eight or nine years old. Fast forward about 15, 15 years later, I'm at the seminary uh, in Berrien Springs, Michigan, and bumped into you walking out of Apple Valley. And you stopped me, and, and I hadn't seen you come in contact with you. You stopped me outside of Apple Valley, and you didn't know my first name, but you said, hey, you're, uh, you're Paul, aren't you? And I was like, oh, my goodness, it's true. His memory is crazy. Um, but it's just such an honor, such an honor to have you, have you with us today. Uh, all right, let's, let's jump in. Dr. Rock, we're going to just give you the time. I'm going to switch you over to uh, just letting everybody see you as you begin. And then um, when you're ready to begin sharing your slides, you can do that. Um, and we're just going to give you, give the audience all you. Thank you. We're ready to go. And I must say, not uh, visible, but this presentation is created and engineered by my dear wife, Sharon, who is going to see to it that I, I present these slides in an orderly way. Now, for those of you listening, the conductors of the program have suggested that we might begin with an overview of the book, Protest and Progress, that's already been mentioned. This book, um, this book was published by Andrews Press in the spring of 2018 and has seen a, a very warm reception among all of the ethnicities in our division and some other places in the world, but particularly in the division and particularly uh, with, the, with, the black, with the black church, if I may put it that way. And I don't mean just the black conferences, but African-American Adventists to whatever conference and whatever church they may belong. The presentation that I'm going to give you now is an overview of the four major attempts of Black Seventh-day Adventists in the North American Division to achieve parity in both membership and mission. And I thought this a, 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 a good way to um, spend an hour or so of African American History Month or week or day. So let's get right into it. The next slide gives you the historical foundation of the book. On the left side, you see the conduct of the government from 1619 to 2000 in five different pods. And on the right side, you see the church's conduct during this time. And as I go over this, you will, you will see the background as I have studied it and envisioned it, that in its various elements have necessitated the protests that are illuminated in the book. Notice, first of all, 
slavery from 1619 till 1865, and of course 1863 was when the Emancipation Proclamation was declared, but the 15th Amendment, if I remember correctly, uh, that that stated the, the the obvious and put into into law and uh, into practice the end of slavery was was had. Now during that time, during this stretch of of slavery, and there's some arguments that slavery may have started earlier, but most books, most historians target 1619. Uh, the church's attitude was definitely anti-slavery. William Miller, who said that he was first tapped on the shoulder by God in 1831, and whose ministry dovetailed into the pre-Adventist years around 1848 when they had the Sabbath conferences and so forth, uh, was very much against slavery as were his supporters. So pre-Adventism was anti-slavery. The next major historical period for the church was what the Southern recovery from 1865 to 1896. Of course, the slave owners were very unhappy and while they were repressed by the Union armies that stayed in the South pretty much until the late 1870s when um, they were pulled out of the South pretty much to protect um, the president who was running at the time. And by 1896, the South had pretty much recovered from the blow of defeat in the Civil War. And remember, the South would have won the war, obviously, historians say, and they are mystified as to why not. We know why. And Ellen White tells us why. And she says the South would have won except God stepped in. And he confused the, the, the Southern generals. And uh, he, he sent angels to turn them back at the Battle of Manassas, or Bull Run. But the South Africa, and they did a good job at putting senators and representatives in place. And by 1896, they were able to establish or have the government, have the Supreme Court ratify that uh, separate but equal was okay. So, in 1896, separate but equal became the brainchild of the South, and separate but equal, which we'll come to next, lasted for 58 years. Now, during this span of recovery, of Southern recovery, the early pioneers of the church, which had formal beginnings in 1865, with John Byington being elected, as the first GC president, until 1896, when separate but equal was inaugurated. During this time of Southern recovery, the early pioneer definitely anti-segregation. Slavery was over. Segregation was rampant. Lynchings, the horrors that occurred when the plantation owners insist by their defeat, rained down their wrath on the heads of the recently four million freed black slaves. All right, so for those first two periods, no question, militarism, early pioneers, anti-slavery, anti-segregation. Then came separate but equal, 1896 to 1954, a eight year uh, period. And uh, during that time, something happened in our church that is explainable, is understandable, at least at first, but 
which as you'll see in a moment, lasted too long, much too long. During this time that the government said blacks and whites are not to mix. Black people cannot go into white assemblies, schools, church services, marriage, miscegenation, all of that was 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 illegal. And white Adventists said, in order to preach the gospel, we can't let these black people in. And that lasted from 1896 to 1924, the whole time of separate but equal. And in fact, lasted a little longer, as we're going to see. But it was very, very much the way the church functioned. And they did it under the rubric of gospel expediency. And that's what they told C.M. Kinney in, in 1898, the year he was ordained at a camp meeting in Nashville. You got to get your people to the back of this auditorium because we cannot have white people come in if you black people are going to sit up here in the middle of the service. And that's when Kenny said, look, if we can't sit in where we need to, like everybody else, we're not going to be able to evangelize black people. So it was a catch-22. And he said, we, we might have to think about having our own black conferences someday. And that was in 1898, a long time before they came about, of course, in 1944. But all during this time, the, the modality changed from anti-slavery, anti-segregation to gospel expediency as the church knuckled in under or beneath the rubric of the government. And while Ellen White had said before she went to Australia in the early 1890s, there should be no separation. When she came back in 1896, and saw how things had hardened, and that in fact, or 18, it wasn't that things had hardened when she came back. She said, look, you better let the whites work for the whites and the black work for the blacks. And that seemed to justify gospel expediency. It wasn't because she was segregationist, and you know from her writings, she was very liberal and very concerned and very anti-slavery and so forth. But she too subscribed and those words to God's expediency until the Lord showed us a better way. Now, in 1954, going down to part number four on the left, civil rights burst upon the scene the same year that separate but equal was annulled. And civil rights lasted, the movement lasted until 1968. During this time, the church, unfortunately, still held on to gospel expediency. And that's where the troubles really burst upon the scene in our organization. Now, before this, there were some other things going on. But the fact that in 1954, and there was one president then, Branson, who wrote a letter in 54 and said, we ought to have brotherhood and everybody love everybody. And that was good but it wasn't good enough to demand that our institutions open up and that our schools drop their quota enrollment uh, stipulations that our hospitals would let us in. And it wasn't until 1965, 11 years later, that the church finally came out with a statement. Now there was an interim statement in 61 that said, love everybody, but that didn't cut it. That wasn't enough to break down the barriers. Meanwhile, the Catholic Church, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, the Episcopal Church, Church of God, and everybody else, really everybody else, every other major denomination had put out papers saying, we got to go with this, folk. No more of this separate but equal. No more of this locking people out in the name of the government. The government has said it's over. But these churches accepted, but Adventism did not declare itself until 1961. And even then, even then, from 68 until 2000, and we say 68 because the civil rights movement was supposedly officially over then, the church, while it had established itself with the government de jure, and as the government 
there wasn't a wholesale de facto com, um, uh, agreement and 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 uh, a, a a wholesale a wholesale following of the of the breakdown or of the annulment of separate but equal at least de jure it was it was written it was law but the adventist church from 65 even on 2000, and I won't go into a lot of details, but I can tell you as an individual who had somewhat to do with civil rights when I was pastoring in Orlando in the early 50s and middle 50s and Miami in the late 50s and early 60s and Detroit in the early 60s and in, in New York in the very early, uh, uh, in, in the latter 60s, just before going to Oakwood, that I I had personal experiences. In 1955, my wife was having our first child, Cheryl, and she couldn't get the Adventist doctor in Winter Park, where we were living, uh, to accept us. But the Catholic doctor did. In the 60s, in the 60s, when I was in Miami, I had occasion to need medical service, and Hialeah Hospital wouldn't let me in. Later in the 60s in Detroit, some of our members from City Temple wanted to join one of the white churches, and they said they had to get permission from the conference, from the Michigan Conference Committee. And uh, later in, uh, in Decatur, when I was Associate Ministerial Secretary at, in the Southern Union, um, from 67 till 69, middle of 69, we couldn't get our children in the Cascade Heights School near where we live not to think about the other church, the churches around the city. But of course, much of that has changed now. But what I'm pointing out was throughout all these years into the 60s and the 70s, and even into the 80s and 90s, there was a very slow metamorphosis insofar as white Adventism was concerned with this matter of desegregation. And so the book is a picture of what was happening all during these years. I'll stop right now. Is there a question on this historical overview? He, gentlemen? Yes, I got yes, I got a question. I don't know if um, Okay. Yeah, you talk about the gospel of expediency and the impact that that had on uh, these uh, social issues. Can you define for us the gospel of expediency? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Gospel expediency was the terminology used to say it's expedient to keep black people out if we're going to baptize white people. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. That's what it was. They simply said, if we're going to baptize white people, we can't let these black people in. And the other part of it was the government says black and white cannot associate together. So you can't come to Loma Linda. You can't get into to, to AUC. You can't get into Southern uh, Missionary or anywhere else because the government said don't do so. So it was expedient for the sake of the gospel for the branding of the church, or ecclesiology, our good name, not to have black people associate with us. Mm. What, what I find very fascinating and, and almost scary with that is, Dr. Rock, is that I have heard that rationale from a guest who was on our, our program, um, what, less than 10 months ago. And, and they said the exact same thing, that in 2020, it was at the time, that it seems that it is more expedient that uh, what well, we were talking about, um, uh, uh, black people going to white churches in 2020. And, and they were yeah. saying, and we've seen this, so you, you black, black members migrate or go to a, a white church, then you have the whole white flight thing. And so the, right. the, they were looking at North America and saying that the white church in North America seems to be diminishing. 
And there seems to be a lot of white conferences that are browning. Um, right. and, and that if we stop going over there to those conferences and to those churches, then perhaps the white work would flourish yet again. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. It, it is it is not dead. Gospel expediency is not good. But I think that uh, as it is now, to the extent that it is now being utilized, it's really done so with a a, a different uh, a different set of variables. The government isn't saying that anymore. Uh, you know that the government no longer has rules and regulations, so it's 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 um, disingenuous for anybody to try to use that argument now. You can almost sympathize with the whites back in the period of of Southern recovery and separate but equal in its earlier years, because the Klan would come in and shut them down. You, you, you can you could have some sympathy. Ellen White had sympathy. But now, no. Uh, when whites are moving out now, it's not gospel expediency. It is uh, gospel timidity. Wow. Wow. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's the historical background. And uh, these are the four periods that we cover in the book. First of all was the push for full participation. That was the first protest. The brethren really wanted to be all in, but they couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get in because of separate but equal and the gospel of the and gospel expediency. All right. So because they couldn't get in, they said in the second protest, let's get our own conferences. And in the early 20s, there were a number of people, some of the names will come up in a moment, who pushed against what the church was doing, and they couldn't take it. So they left, and they established their own Sabbatarian denominations, and you've studied some of them. But this was the push for colored conferences, and it's amazing that Black Adventists never started their own church. There was never any major schism, we used to call it, and schism as I hear it today, where blacks pulled out and started their own Seventh-day Adventist denomination. It, it, it's a miracle. But they didn't because most of the main preachers, well, that's not even possible to say either, but many of the strongest preachers stayed in the church and they continued to fight and they might not have have figured it out and thought it through as well as we can looking back. But it seemed that they were saying in their heart, no, we weren't mistreated, but we're not going to leave. We're going to hang in here with the Sabbath. We're going to hang in here with the commandments. And we're going to hang in here with Ellen White and her books and her papers that they love. So they did. But then in 1944, the president of the General Conference surprised the brethren and brought them together and said, well, we have said in the past no to your desire. And that began, the first big push was in 29. We, we've said no, but look, a lot of things have happened. You now have almost 18,000 members. We don't know what to do with these people. And things are changing in the government. Separate but equal was still there, but a lot of things were happening. The foundations of separate but equal were being shaken, and there were cracks. There were cracks in the foundation, and people, black people, were beginning to rise up, and Lucille Byard had just been refused at the sanitarium in Washington, and that was a big flare-up. And there were things going on at Emmanuel Missionary College and Owen Troy Sr., the only THB I know about, African-American, was studying uh, around Chicago. And, and, and things were happening that were shaking the foundation uh, of uh, gospel expediency. Uh, well, didn't shake it loose, but at least was telling the leadership of the church that they had to do something. So they brought all the leaders together and said, now you get your conference. And this is when and how black conferences began. That is also detailed in the book. The third 
uh, push was a push for black unions um, in 1969. And this was begun by pastors, men like yourselves, you three brethren. It wasn't begun by, by conference presidents. Presidents wouldn't even sign the first letters that these young fellows led by Jesse Wagner, Jr., my colleague, and others of our age at that time who were in our 30s, these men said, let's get unions. And finally, the black presidents joined them. And that fight raged until about 1980. Really, I think the last vote was in 1979. And uh, the story of how some blacks wanted it and some did not is covered in the book. And that's a fascinating era in my ministry of how my friends and my elders to whom I looked up, who were in a general conference, a union conference, so forth, how they fought each other, blacks against blacks. Um, those who wanted black unions were called uh, field Negroes, and those that didn't want it were called house Negroes, only they didn't say Negroes, they had other terminology. But that was the third big push, and that was defeated. The first push was defeated. The second one in red was successful. The third one in green failed. And the fourth one for equitable retirement, the uh, rationale for which we'll cover in a moment, succeeded and is now going super well. And uh, we're proud of that. So these are the four major successes or stories that are covered the four major protests. Any question about that before we move on in perspective elder is that, elder, you, you just keep talking doc you you're just dropping knowledge we want to catch it all okay the next slide the next slide uh leads you into the push for full participation and uh, you'll see that uh, these are all the denials that were being suffered membership in the church admission to school hiring in various institutions employment in the conference and equal pay. Those were the denials that uh, were pushing them, the brothers and the sisters in that first protest. And of course, there were consequences to the gospel of equal, the gospel of uh, the, 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 the moniker of gospel expediency. <laughs> the consequences were discouragement of members, discouragement of potential members, defection of colored leaders, as we were called, a waste of valuable talent and a lack of physical resources. The next slide gives you the names of some of the big uh, personalities who were involved. I mentioned Kenny, uh, who protested in 1898 and said, one day we may need black conferences 46, be year, 46 years before they were given to us. Wow. Then there was Sheaf who protested to Ellen White in letters and personally, and you read about him. And then there was James Howard, a, a, a very successful attorney in the Washington, D.C. area. He, too, protested. And Humphrey, J.K. Humphrey at Ephesus, uh, who had his major protest in the 28-29 era. Other major defections were John and Charles Manns, the Manns brothers, in uh, Savannah, who left the church in 1915. They couldn't take it any longer. They wanted in and couldn't get in. Louis Sheaf, that brilliant attorney uh, who protested to Ellen White and J.K. Humphrey, and of course, Anna Bontops in 1935, a fascinating figure, a part of the Harlem Renaissance, born in, in, in Louisiana. Parents grew up at Adventist out in California, went to School, high school, and grammar school, and high school in LA. Finally, went to PUC, graduated, taught school at Harlem Academy. Later, taught at Oakwood. He was there during the Scottsboro Boys treatment. Some of you may know of in thirty, in the early thirties, and he was blamed for this strike, the strike at Oakwood in thirty or thirty-one. He was blamed because by then he was teaching at Oakwood, and he left Oakwood uh, as. Uh, as Moran was coming in, and he left the church, and he died a Catholic or a Lutheran, can't wow. remember quite which specifically, but he was a part, he was a perhaps the best-known author, writer 
in the history of Black Adventism and maybe Adventism itself in terms of the broader society. Wow. All right. Then uh, there were early appeals that were made in 1909, 1918. I won't go through them. I think the principles have been covered. So uh, let's move on to the push for colored conferences. The push for colored conferences began with the denial in 29, the Brethren appeal, and 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 I heard this from my my uh, my father-in-law, now deceased, Elder Peterson, my former father-in-law. He was at some of these me this meeting, in fact, this one, and he said the Brethren told Elder Peterson, the Brethren told them, no, you can't have colored conferences, and I didn't hear it individually or personally, but I read his his recount. And don't ask for this again till Jesus comes. Hmm. And they meant it. They wanted us to work on under gospel expediency. But then uh, after the general conference came to the brethren and said, please have your conferences, this is when they were born. And they were born when we had over 17,000 members. We had only 1,000 members in 1909, 3,500 in 1918, only 100 in, two, in, in 1,000 in, 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 in 1900, I should say. And now with 17,000 and the Lucy Byard affair and other things going on in government, we were told, get your conferences. They were organized. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depends on how you look at it, the West Coast decided not to go along with it. And there are reasons for that, and you can read them also in the book. This is how the conferences were born, beginning with uh, a lake region and uh, right on through southeastern. So uh, the third, and that was the push for black unions that started in 69. Um, the black membership had grown by that time to a number that allowed the brethren to think, well, uh, we, we need more than just conferences. And there was a whole business of, of, of a lack of mobility, a lack of lateral mobility, not only, not only vertical into unions where there was no such thing in 1968 when Bob Carter became the first black union president and that was an elite union Lake Union has led the way in a lot of in a lot of manners, but at any rate, up until then, there was no there was no vertical movement, although there were a few blacks placed here and there. It wasn't the the track of of conference to union leadership, and there was no lateral mobility because in each union the brethren. Uh, uh, were involved with white conferences and white leadership didn't know how to get a president from another union into some union that didn't have necessary leadership for their black conference. And so there was a thought, we need to do this. So we'll have all, we'll have several conferences black in one union and we can accelerate lateral mobility and have enough power to speak uh, vertically as well because that will put union officers on the general conference committee and other places where they are not now, not to mention the division committees. So the appeals were made and they were turned down in 69, 70, 76. And uh, you read in the book how the integrationists, Banfield, Canson, and Hale, of course, Hale later changed and he became a self-determinationist which is what I am calling those who were for black unions <laughs> and uh, like it. Bradford and Cleveland and Dudley. And the only reason I have segregated these names into these arenas is that these are the people who not just talk, they wrote. A lot of people were talking, but these people left documents, papers, most of which I have. And there was a wonderful, wonderful time for research into sociology and anthropology and history and theology. It was great, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, 
for the years of the Black Union debate, the church had its most in-depth look into the sociological concerns uh, of, of the church, black and white in particular, in its history uh, that I know of. Now, of course, Bradford went in to the division as president in 79. And when that happened, a lot of people exhaled and said, well, we've made it. But of course, you never make it just because you've got a black leader at the top. Um, Obama's presidency proved that to us. You, you don't change That's everything. Right. That's right. But it does help. It wow. does help. And he did a lot of wonderful things to help us. But the fact that we lost him, and he was he was the premier voice, or one of them, for black unions. But when he became the president of the division, he couldn't fight for it like he used to, because of course that wouldn't have wouldn't have been possible for anybody. But beside that, we'd exhausted our 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 material our our gunshot, and so we let it go. Now the black Adventist leadership protest style grid you see here is interesting. Um, I tried to get every name type as principle or in principle and means and benefit and risk. Take uh, let's say Banfield in the middle there. His big thing was cultural sharing. His, that's what his writings reveal. He he said that could be handled with a lot of education and that the benefit would be cultural enhancement to keep us together so we wouldn't have to have black unions. But in our view or mine, the big risk for what he was talking about was political emasculation. Because once you get everybody in the same pot, you lose the political punch that you have when all of your blackness is together. You've got a tremendous punch. But when you disseminate it through whatever measure, you no longer have a, a single punch to describe what you need, but you have to go along with the political agenda of everybody else or try to get your agenda by what everybody else is trying to do. So you, if you get the book, you can study it. And uh, there were a number of significant events. And again, these are votes, one in 77, 78, another one in 78. Well, the, in 1978, that last part, we had an article in the review written by two individuals. One said, no, we don't need it. That was Alan Anderson in DC. And one said, yes. And that's the one they asked me to write. And if you ever go back to your review in 78, I think it was September or so, you get a copy of them. Now, we go on. Uh, there were negative votes in 78, negative vote in 79. But in 79, let's go back to just a little. In 79, if we can't get black unions, we're going to have territorial councils. Now, a territorial council, as we devised, devised it, was going to be almost like a union. We were going to have a president of the territorial council, and we were going to have secretaries to do mission work. And we thought that even though we would stay in the present unions, we would have quasi unions on the side, which you know, Dudley was going to be president of one union. And we, we had it all figured out. We had it all figured out. But uh, uh, most, most of the fellas backed out of that. Just a few people hung in. And I think it's good that it didn't go down because they would have put those people who were determined to do this, they probably would have been sanctioned and would have had a hard time staying in the ministry. But it would have been a very radical departure from uh, organization. Finally, the push for equitable retirement. This was the fourth of the uh, of the of the protest. It was short and swift and very effective, as you know. And praise God, most of you will be beneficiaries. Uh, they figured out Amen. that even though it was equal. It was not equitable. It was equal because the black conferences put the same percentage of tithe into the retirement fund, and they got the same percentage in their checks once they retired, but it wasn't equitable. And the reason that it wasn't equitable is that the white brethren live longer than black brethren. And you know, white America lives longer than black America. So they were able to retire and live on these benefits 
these equal benefits for an inequitable period of time. And not only that, but the liquid assets, the intergenerational wealth of whites is so much more than blacks, 10 times as much uh, most, most sociologists tell us. And black ministers work all their lives, that, but they don't have any backing with their families to fall back on. And when they retire, they don't retire into any wealth and homes and stocks and bonds. So they figured they needed to do something to make this whole situation more equitable. And you see the list of things that uh, control their thoughts. So they had a big debate in 98 and they had another one in uh, 98 with the amongst themselves, the caucus. Then they got together in 98 with the North American division leadership and that didn't go well. Then they got together in 99 uh, with uh, some independent study guides. And in the year 2000, they met with the General Conference and the Union Conference officers uh, um, to talk about this plan. And um, Elder, Elder uh, President, who was there, said, look, the General Conference president Look, you, you, you fellows want your, your, your separate retirement, but suppose I don't give them to you. Uh, this is what my good friend Jan asked them. And it was Norman Miles, Norman Miles, who said, look, Mr. President, if you're on a bus and it's going the wrong way, the only three things to do you keep going the wrong way or you turn around and go back or you get off the bus. <laughs> and when he said that, when he said that, the general conference president said, well, we better let these fellas study this a little longer. We better not turn them down quite yet. And he determined that a study should be made and it was made by Marty and Blair of, uh, of Florida hospital system. And he, he agreed that it could be done mechanically. So they went then with Norman Miles' speech. And all the other presidents were there with Norman Miles' speech in his mind. And uh, they, the, the North American Division said, OK, let him go. And that's how we got the retirement plan. So what about the challenge ahead? LD. What are we going to do about all this? LD. The big question is, do we need? Regional conferences. It, yeah, I'm going to stop. Yeah, no, yeah. Hold okay, on. Just go give ahead. me a quick second. I want to go ahead yeah. and just let everybody know what's going on right quick before we get to that next slide. Um, if you are just tuning in, you are watching the Pastors Roundtable today. We are excited to have you. But this is what we need you to do. We only got about a half hour left. And, and we know there's some I see. I've seen some of you sharing, sharing and tagging folk. Um, uh, we're going to have a question and answer. So I want you to write some of your questions down because we're going to give you opportunity to ask some of these questions. Obviously, we won't be able to get to everybody's question, um, but we want you to set some aside so when we get to that time that you can ask them. Um, if you have not shared the stream, if you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel that you may be watching this on, now is a great time to do that and go ahead and click that bell. Um, Roger, anything else we want to let them know before we um, give that slide, that screen back to Dr. Rock? No, I think, I think you covered it all. I'm just taking notes. I'm taking copious notes. I'm getting <laughs> yes, ready, boy. I, you know, I, I'm excited. Dr. Rock, wow. you have just, you are sharing such wonderful yes. knowledge. Uh, the chat is just filled with uh, so many wows and yeah. tell it, Dr. <laughs> Rock. And they're re really excited for this. So we we thank you for that. Again, put your put your questions in the chat. Um, we're going to share some things on to how you can get the book a little later. But uh, we, we're just excited to be here in the space with Dr. Rock. Yeah. If you've got a yeah, question, we're learning today. <laughs> if, if you're typing your question in the chat, again, it's all it's going to be very difficult to get to everybody's question. But if you would pref, pre, preface, precede, if you would put a cue in front of your text, just as to let us know that that's a question, and we're going to try to do our best to get it to Doc as we go through. All right, Doc, we're going to let you go ahead and pick up with that uh, that slide that you were on. Okay. I, all right. I'll I'll be brief because I I want the questions. Uh, the, the next slides have to do with the yes or no for regional conferences 
And in, in, a, in a nutshell, my answer is yes, we need them. And I have in the book, and I have before you, my reasoning. And it has to do with the principle of unity, uh, of, of unity. That does not mean unison. Are the conferences segregated? No. Segregation says you can't come in. They're not segregated. And are they a duplication? No. Even though they cover the same uh, geography, they may be a duplication of geography. They are not a duplication of culture, and that's the big difference. And we're living in a post-racial society. I don't think that's true. And I think if you look around at what's happening with the alt-right and what's going on with the Trumpers and all, you'll know that there's no such thing as a post-racial society. Love breaks down all barriers. Yes, it does, but it doesn't overcome cultural barriers. It doesn't change culture. Love doesn't change culture necessarily. It may over, over decades and millennia or, or centuries, but it helps cultures to know how to get along. That's what love does. Love doesn't change my taste for food or music or preaching, but it'll help me to tolerate yours. Uh, regional conferences reduce regional conferences reduce member fellowship. No, 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 no. There's no more fellowship out where I live in Las Vegas between the two churches than there is in Pittsburgh or or anywhere else where there are black conferences. Black conferences don't get along any black churches don't get along any more famously where there are no black conferences than they do where there are black conferences. And of course, that crazy argument, there'll be no separate conferences in heaven. Well, of course not. There'll be no conferences in heaven. <laughs> and again, the whole thing is sociological consideration. Desegregation versus segregation. Uh, your speaker is all for desegregation. When I was pastoring in Miami and schools were being desegregated back in the early 60s, I heard, I saw a group of Caucasian ladies, must have been 15, 20 of them, with signs walking down the street and the sign said, two, four, six, eight, I don't want to integrate. Wow. Well, I said, that's pretty good. I don't either. And when I went to Andrews for a Black History uh, banquet, one year I preached, I, I gave a talk, two, four, six, eight. I don't want to integrate. Wow. And they burned crosses that next morning. They burned some crosses on the campus, but they didn't understand. What I was saying is integration is fine, but integration has come to mean assimilation. When you speak of integration now, people think you're talking about homogenizing the cultures, but it's desegregation we need. The opposite of segregation is desegregation, not integration as it's generally uh, understood. So if I want to marry white and integrate, that's fine. I'll integrate the blood and have a little baby, and that'll be integrated baby. But you know what they'll call that baby? Black. Black. That's right. That'll be a black baby. So, you know, uh, it's disingenuous to talk about What's going to happen in heaven when we're still on earth? We've got to work with the cultural realities that are around us. And that has to do with some other things that I won't have time to go into there. And the main need for our church, in my opinion, because all Protestantism is conservative, uh, we need more scholars to tell us what God said through the lens of the oppressed and uh, the have-nots and then we'll have a more accurate view of what Jesus did, what he said he was going to do in Luke 4, 18 and 19, what Isaiah said should be done in, in Isaiah 58. Before he said, take your feet off the Sabbath, he said, break the yoke, Mercy. break the chain, loose mm. the prisoner. Uh -huh. And that happens before he said, take your foot off the Sabbath. So mm. we got to remember that. And, and do and, and of course, the other thing about regional conferences that seems to me to suggest their validity is their growth from 
five hundred thousand uh, dollars in tithe when we started in '44 to over two hundred and twenty-six million when I checked yesterday in tithes and offering. Praise God! Uh, you just can't beat that. And from seven percent of the church when we organized to today, it's really thirty-three percent. It was. Th 22 and 16, but it's 33% because as we are growing, the Caucasian membership is lessening. And the Spanish now have 27. We've got 33. Caucasians got 33. And we can thank God for regional conferences and their mission uh, maximization that's making this possible. And we ought to know regional conferences are not a thirst for power, for retaliation, for revenge for arrogance or pride. It's for mission, indigenous leadership to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And the primary areas of study, we'll talk about that in this last slide, perhaps, or the final slide that I'm going to, to, to put up. Uh, the next major protest, people say, well, what's the next protest? The next major protest for Seventh-day Adventists, Black Seventh-day Adventists, might very well not involve racial freedoms or authority. More likely, it should involve various attempts to improve relational issues within the black community. And I'm talking about Haitians, uh, Caribbean, West Indians. I'm talking about uh, Africans. I'm talking about those born in America. We need to get our thing together and pool our energies and pool our efforts. And uh, remember that the big call is not for mixing, it's for fixing. Now, it's all right to mix. It's all right to mix. And, and, and if anybody wants to go to school, marry, go to church. In fact, I go to the white church in town as much as I do the black church. I can't hear myself think when I'm in the black church for all that banging on the drums. <laughs> I, I can't. I want to talk to my wife. I got to holler at her. I don't like that. So if I want to mix and go somewhere else, and I can do that, that's fine. Now, I'd rather hear the black preaching, but it, you know, it becomes a design and a desire for what allows you to worship best. And that's what we must accept and stop beating each other up because we have regional conferences or because somebody leaves a regional conference and goes to a state conference. That's all right. That's all right. We gotta learn to tolerate, to adjust, and to love and to eyes on the cross prize and march on to heaven, loving one another. But remember, the only way we're going to get it done in the black community is for fixing it. And we are best able to do that because when you have black leadership, it is not, it is indigenous leadership. White leadership in the black community is alien. And indigenous leadership is always more effective than alien. Mm. Case closed. I'm done. Your questions. Hey, man. Drop good the stuff. mic. Drop the <laughs> mic. <laughs> this is good Drop stuff. Listen, mic. we've had a number of questions that have come. I want to get to them. And as, as, we, as we scroll through there, um, Doc, there's one question, or one criticism, I think, that has often come in these conversations when cases have been made um, for the continued existence of, of black conferences. And I wanna just kinda uh, uh, tepidly move towards one of them. As uh, you enumerated some of the arguments, many of them, some could argue, were, were more so directed at why we should continue to have local black churches as opposed to the whole, you know, larger organization in terms of at the conference level. Could, could you take us a little deeper for maybe, maybe you know, take, take a minute or so and, 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 and see if we can make even a case, not just for the local churches having culture and whatnot there, but for the organ, at the organizational level, the conference level, why it's important to, to keep the conferences, um, um, our regional conferences in terms of that, or that structure in place. Okay. Well, yeah, I have and I'm worked saying that, under let me, both. Let me just clarify again, because even, even within, like we see it out on the West Coast, and that was one of the questions that came up. Why did we not see 
conferences, regional conferences develop on the West Coast. But even though they, ha they, they have not developed there, we still see in a non-regional conference or non-black conference, you still see black cultured congregations on the West Coast. So that's... Territorial, that's, con territorial um, contexts. Sure, yes. Yeah, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. The big question is, and I'll try to answer your question uh, more specifically, but more broadly, the big question is not why do we have regional conferences, but why does a large and thriving minority need a wheel within a wheel to take care of its missiological and political interests? Hmm. Why is that? And it is demonstrated here on the Pacific Coast where we don't have regional conferences, but we have regional coordinators. And the regional coordinator has, he's black, and he has a black secretary, and a black office, and a black budget, and a black workers meeting, and a black camp meeting, and a black newspaper. He might as well have a black conference. So they're just as, yeah, yeah. The only thing he lacks <clears throat> is the authority to sit automatically on the union committee now, has that and always been so, or is that more of a recent development? In those What's that? Has that always been like that on the West Coast conferences, or is that more no, of a recent development? it hasn't development? always been. The, re the regional coordinators are within the last, what, 20 years or so. But before oh. that, the brethren suffered greatly, and they admitted it. And some of them wanted a conference, but by, I think the vote was 46 to 54, the members of the church just said, no, we will try to perfect what we have rather than go into a regional conference. So that was our decision out here. But the point I'm making is you got to have something. And the reason you got to have something is that black Americans are the only group that was brought to America against its will. We didn't want to come here. Black Americans or everybody else wanted to be an immigrant. We were dragged here and we were put here and they put up boundary maintaining mechanisms for hundreds of years. I showed yeah. you on the first slide, slide and those boundary maintaining mechanisms of slavery and reconstruction and separate but equal and dragging their feet since then that surrounded us, made us develop a huge culture that cannot be maximized for mission without indigenous leadership. And that indigenous leadership has to begin, so it seems, at the head of the local work. So that when you go to a workers' meeting, I've been to workers' meeting out here after retirement in a non-regional conference, and I had, to, I had to struggle to stay awake because a lot of things they discussed didn't apply to me. White churches don't function like black churches. Let's face it. White churches don't have the same problems that we have in, in most, I guess I can still say most, but many, probably most, black communities. And when you are a pastor, you don't pastor just your congregation. You are a pastor in the community. You're supposed to be a community leader. Right. Right. And how does a white pastor become that? Well, maybe so, some. Sure. But it's alien to him, and the people look upon him as an alien, usually, unless he can make friends readily. So black leadership, by virtue of the situation, the need, the, the missiological situation, demands, in my opinion, indigenous leadership and not alien. And that's why... We need leadership at that level. Very good. Great. Mm -hmm. L listen, Elder, let, let's see if we can run through a couple of these questions that are here right quick. The last one that was on the screen from Samuel Williams early on. Um, is there a reason why regional conferences never happened on the West Coast? Any quick answer for that? Yes, it's because in 1929, when they were first discussed, uh, there were some black preachers there, and in 1943 they were there, but Elder Peterson had just been made the union coordinator 
of the black work on the Pacific Coast in 1942. And everybody out here was rejoicing. So that had not happened in most places in the South and East. So we fought out here. I say we, I was only 12, <laughs> but we thought it was a great thing. We thought it was a great thing. And so we said, we, we already got it. We don't need to go into conferences. And some people think we missed the boat. Others think differently. My mother, who died in 2010, was a primary opponent of regional conferences on the West Coast, although her brother, Charles Bradford, is who he is and what he was in the work. And I was certainly involved. But she and I had a lot of debates. I had to stop talking to my mama about this matter <laughs> because she fought black conferences. But her yeah. thing was, I'm not going to let these white people run me out of their church. Okay. I'm not going to. She, she, was, she was fiercely black. But her thing was, and I think that was the argument out here largely, we're not going to let these white folk run us out. We're going to stand up and we're going to stay right mm -hmm. where we are. So wow. that's what they're doing. Okay, that's right. I, I, I want to say, say this before we go to the next question, uh, Pastor Paul. That was a very interesting story that she told in the book. You know, when I read that about <laughs> your mother being the proponent of, of not having uh, regional conferences. But let me just say this, and I know we have a lot of questions here. But why, why is it that um, pressure from the outside, it takes pressure from the outside of the church for us to really think about change? For example, you mentioned uh, Claude Barnett, the journalist, and how he would pressure the church and say, listen, things are not right. Do you want me to write about this? Why is it? that we are the last ones to make this statement. Can you just address that real quick and then we'll go to some of those questions that are on the line. Well, the quickest way I can say it <laughs> is that we just have not had writers from the, from the uh, enslaved descendants of the enslaved. We haven't had writers in the oppressed class. We haven't had writers in the lower class of society to read the Greek and the Hebrew and tell us what God said. Mm -hmm. All that I know, I, I was sleeping during Greek when Rogers was trying to teach me at wow. Oakwood. I was milking cows at 4.30, so at 10 o'clock when they had Greek, I was asleep. Right. And I can't read the Greek or the Hebrew, so what I read, I read what some white fella tell me. What we need is more black people like you, more young black men and women to go to school and yeah, a D man is fine, but you got to go get a PhD, a research degree where you have systematic New Testament, Old Testament. You can read the original wow. languages and you tell me what God said. Mercy. Wow. I'm tired of reading what. <clears throat> oh, I don't get me started. Not, Dr. Rock. <laughs> that's, that's exactly Dr. what gonna, we're I'm trying to do, ask, Doc. <laughs> I'm going to ask the question. I want my black I'm... brothers and sisters to tell me what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. My white brothers do as well as they can, but they can't feel it like you and I can. My Lord. They My can't Lord. feel our great grandfathers being castrated out in the woods out there at Oakwood, where Oakwood now is. They can't, they don't feel that black body, strange, strange fruit swaying in the wind. Mm -hmm. They can't My feel Lord. it. My Lord. But you can. And if you and I, if you too late for me, but if you and the others will go to school and learn how to read it and come back and tell it, then we won't have to wait for some journalists to embarrass us. We'll have an accurate view of who Jesus was. Jesus was a radical. Wow. That's it. That's it. That's, I, I want to, I want to ask something. Read, um, I want to ask something that is, uh, that that's not in the question list that we've had, but it is something that Dr. Rock brought out in terms of having the indigenous population lead uh, the indigenous leadership lead the indigenous population. In terms of the immigrants that came to the United States from the Caribbean, where I came from, uh, from other black areas, from Africa, where now we're seeing pockets of these indigenous groups that the churches that are grouping together, building up uh, uh, an association that is, 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 is kind of the precursor of what we wanted to have happen um, with the black conferences. Um, but we are beginning to see there's a rift. 
There are conferences right now that have rifts because one church is West Indian, one church is African American, and and there is no understand. What are some of the what insight can you share with that uh, to us today, Doctor Rock? Again, culture makes a huge difference in the way people eat, the way people dress, the way people worship, preach, sing, think, and we'll just have to learn to tolerate one another mm. and not try to make every put everybody into the same melting pot. When I was at Oakwood, I'll tell you this real quick, a young lady came to my office, and it's in the book, I think. And she said, Mr. President, it's a shame the way all the black American students eat on one side of the calf and the and the international students eat on the other. And I got up in chapel and said, let's everybody eat together. Not all the Americans and all the West Indians and Africans over here. Everybody come together. And of course, I'm my father's from Barbados, so I can talk about it, right? And I got up and said, everybody, we got to come together. And for about a day and a half, they came together. But when I went back into the cafeteria a couple of days later, I saw all the black Americans on one side students were together, and the California students were together, and the Cleveland, <laughs> Chicago students were together. And I looked over the other side of the international, and all the Africans were together, and the Ghanaians were together, and the Jamaicans were together. And I said, oh, leave it alone. Let them eat and enjoy their food. <laughs> Let them enjoy themselves. So as long as we can tolerate each other, as long as we can tolerate each other and learn to live. Same thing happened to me at the GC. I refused to eat at the black table. I was a vice president. And I saw all those black folk who worked at the general conference eating at the same table. I won't call their names, but, but they're wonderful people. You know them. They're, 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 they're giants. But I wouldn't go and say, I am a vice president. I travel to, you know, uh, I, do you know what? I was so miserable over there eating. I, I wanted so badly. My ears were just tingling. What were they talking about? Why would I have been so much fun? So after about 12 of my 14, of my 16 years, 12 or 14, I just said, huh, I'm going to go sit down and eat with the rest of my boys. And I went over there with Charles Brooks. Oh, I said I wasn't going to name them. Wasn't going to name them. But I went over there with my boys, all these people who were my classmates from Oakwood, and who I grew up with, and I found out they were having such fun, and it's just natural. So we can't get angry at each other. That's right. Because yeah. people eat together or worship together. We got to learn to tolerate it and love it and understand it. All right. Great. Listen, I, we got a whole bunch of questions and we got about eight minutes or seven minutes. I'm going to just throw some up real quick. Um, uh, Dr. Cornish, you're going to have to talk to us about this one. I don't, I don't think we want to know the answer to this one on the air right now, not after all of that. Um, so, so hold that. Um, let's see. I saw one from, um, let's see, where was that? From here. Uh, Sarah Sultan asks, what do you think about the current direction of regional conferences on the, oh, and we lost it. Ah, uh, he's going to have to call back in. Oh, my goodness. Uh, but the question was, gentlemen, what do you think about the current direction of regional conferences on the local level? Um, uh, on the we local. He calls back. Uh, yeah, that's, a, yeah. that's not what we want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> he just dropped wow. out. So, uh, let me, let me, we, say, let me say this. As, yeah. as we try to get Dr. Rock back, maybe, maybe we need a call him or so just to tell him to, to come back on. But I just want to encourage our viewers, please get this book. A lot of the questions you're asking, they have some exciting stories in this book. This West Con uh, the, the West Coast and the, the strive for regional conferences there. It's there in the book. Um, I heard of, oh, is yeah, he on? I think we got him. Uh, yeah, yeah, we right. got him. All right. Okay. If you could put me in the main screen, Aslam, I have the graphic and where they can get it. Okay. Uh, okay. Glad to have you back, Doc. Yeah, yes, Doc. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, let's All go right. to that, that question one more time, uh, Pastor Paul. Yeah. Um, I think, go ahead. Can you pull yeah, it up? I got to find it again. Where it, here it is. Sarah Sultan asks, um, what do you think about the current direction of regional conferences on the local and in the conference level? The current direction of regional conferences. I don't know what that direction is. Mm. 
Can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can hear yes. you. Yes. I don't know what that direction is. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Um, there's that answer. All right. Yeah, I mean, I, well, well, what I mean is I don't know how it differs from past directions. Got if it. it's like it was in the past, I think it's fine. But I, I'm not sure what the question entails. Okay. All right. Any of you guys, if you guys see any other questions that I missed, feel free to, to bring them out as I'm trying to scroll back because people have been dropping questions for a while. Um, so Michael, Michael Brown asked a question. Um, you know, okay. our church has just been named the most multicultural church um, denomination in America. Um, what will it take to make us a multicultural church where cultural assimilation is no longer the exception. The expectation, I think is it. Or the expectation. Yeah, cultural assimilation is no longer the expectation. I think it will take education mm. and awareness on the part of leadership and teaching the people and having them to understand that America nor the Adventist church is a melting pot. The founders of this nation said they wanted America to be a melting pot where all the nations go in, Russian, mm. German, Jewish, English, uh, <laughs> Romanian, whoever, you know, Poland, everybody goes in, but they're all white. Mm. <laughs> you put black, you put African in there and it changes the color. You put all these white people in there and the product is white, blue-eyed, blonde, brunette, whatever. But you put black, and it comes out another color. And the hair is different. And the nose is flat. And the lips are thick. And the color is dark. And they don't want that. Truth is, some of us don't want that. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I well, what we have to have is appreciation for who we are. We are a flower garden. That's what Ellen White calls us, mm. a flower garden. All the different mm -hmm. flowers are part of what God has created, and we must learn to appreciate it. And the only thing I know, Brother Wade, passed away, is education. Mm. Okay. All right. Pastor uh, Paul, I don't know if you have a question that you were going to read. I have a, another question I want to just uh, put out there, but I want to make sure we get time for our viewership questions to come. So I don't know if you have a pressing one you want to put yeah, up there right there now. There was a question from a Miss Bowie that I wanted to combine with another question that I saw. Okay. Here it is. Okay, so so Miss Bowie is asking, where are all the white members going? If that church is shrinking, <laughs> when you had that graph up, uh, and then Wu and I, man, I can't pronounce Wu's last name, but I know Wu Wu. Wu says, talk about the current white church opposition to Black Lives Matter. So where are all the white Adventist members going if that, that, that piece of the pie there is shrinking? Um, do they just, are they just dying off? And then what about the current white church's opposition to Black Lives Matter? Now, we, we, and we're talking about the white people who oppose it, because we know there are several who do not. Um, but those that yes. are, what's, what's up with that? <clears throat> well, if you look at uh, England, when all of the um, Caribbeans moved in, to London when they first started moving in, it was it was a white Adventist, it, it was it was a white English mm -hmm. membership. Right. But right. you can hardly find a white Englishman in London. Oh, and period. where do they go? A, you're not saying a white Adventist, you're saying a white Englishman. Well, I mean a white Adventist. That's really okay. what I mean. Okay, got it. Got a it. White okay. Adventist. And you can you can hardly find a white Adventist in New York. Mm. Where do they go? I don't know. I think some have house churches, and I think some move to to Idaho and uh, Wisconsin, where they figure you won't move. It's too cold. They're about right. <laughs> but we there now. We there now. Trust me. I can tell you. I can I can attest to that. Being in the American Union. That's right. Why are we? The American Union. Right well, there. then they're going to go to Canada. But 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 honestly, and we, we can smile, we can smile, and maybe that's good. But yes, the fact that, and we need to talk about this for us as well, because these cultures follow suit. 
If we don't do something, black Americans are hard to find in New York as well right now. Mm -hmm. Where did they go? Yeah. Wow. We're all the black, yeah, that, we're all yeah. the black, you know, when I grew up in New York and when I pastored in New York, Ephesus and all these other churches, you know, they were American blacks, but where are those American blacks? That's real. So that's a question that I, I can't answer except to say that in South, in, in South Africa, this I know from personal experience, when they merged the white locals with the black local conferences, a lot of those white people went to Australia and New Zealand. Mm. Pastors. So there's some places to go, but uh, I don't know exactly where, and I can't answer that question. Now, the other part of your question was, what was the um, second part? The, the, what about the, how do we address the, the white members who oppose Black Lives Matter? I think that was the gist of it. Again, it's just a matter of education. They have to, we, we've had a false picture of Jesus. Our white mm. and other theologians have painted a false picture of Jesus. We have to see Jesus, the radical, who was blessing out the robber barons of his day and who died as a seditionist. He didn't die as a blasphemer. He died because they claim he opposed Rome. Hmm. Wow. wow. We have to yes. remember that he died from a political accusation. Mm. Yes. We have to teach them that politics is not dirty. Mercy. That as rightly defined, politics is the means by which a people conduct the other government that God ordained. God ordained the state. Paul tells us that. And politics is how we run it. But when it becomes dirty, we have to be careful not to get immersed in it. But there's no, no fault or nothing wrong with getting involved in it as long as we keep it clean and as long as we address the political situation with the rubric and the principles of the word of God but our our writers have told us that righteousness is a is a vertical posture righteousness is god and me in prayer and devotion but the old testament prophets make it clear that righteousness is justice ah. mm -hmm. righteousness is on how you treat people yes and that's not yeah. an odd doctor like it ought to be and until it is we're going to have trouble with people understanding Black Lives Matter. Not only white people, but black people That's understanding right. it. Yeah. Mm. Because we have drunk the Kool-Aid, just like the Fox News people put it out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, my, wow. oh, my, oh, uh, my. Uh, let me say this. Um, I, I have so many other questions for you, but I know that time is running out this morning you were at bethany church in miami and did a magnificent job i spoke to the pastor about it and i know that last night you were also on another program i believe or yesterday evening for you and so we don't want to wear you out but let me tell you it has been a privilege a distinct privilege of having you on our program today listen this is the book. You got to get this book. This Thank book, you. Progress and Progress. It, you know, what I'm learning from this book, Dr. Rock, is simply this, that there is a place uh, within our church where we can protest against the wrongs that are happening in here and be involved in the in societal issues as we wait for the imminent return of Jesus. And uh, this, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But for, for those of you who are up the good work, to, you you the good those work. of you who are figuring out where to get the book, uh, even in our chat, uh, the uh, advancedsource.org, which is uh, the resource, um, the resource arm of our church, they have the book available, um, and so you can go to advancedsource.org. And you can order the book there. Um, there are other places you can get the book. I'm not sure other places, but you want to get that in your library. Uh, it is 
good reading, excellent reading. Um, you don't want to miss the opportunity to, to hear from the heart of Dr. Rock. He's done an awesome job in presenting our history or the history yes. of, of the Seven Day, Black Seventh-day Adventist Church. Pass away, pass away. I think here from the Pastors Roundtable, we can give away about two books. I think two. we could give away about two books, Pat, Pat Wade. What do you think about that? Well, I think we could do it. Y'all don't want that me happened. to give away a book? Y'all think I got something against the book? Just the two of y'all <laughs> give away a book? I want to give away a book. Can I give away a book, right, too? So now three, three books. books? So, so this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Uh, from the Pastors Roundtable, we are going to give away three books, three books to our listeners. What? And um, we're going to have to figure out a way how to do that because we're doing this on the fly. But, we <laughs> 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 but we're going to figure out a way to do that. And I know, well, you know that you'll we, be we are we are we are we are fulfilling our mandate of being a resource opportunity. So there you go. not only are we resourcing you in inf information on each Sabbath, but we also want to put it in your hand. So uh, look, join the group. We will be sharing in the group how you can get a free book. And uh, so we'll be jumping on that before the end of this month. So there are a number of things we'll be giving away this month. A lot of it dealing with black history. And you want to make sure you're part of that. All right. Do, do we need to ask a question and have somebody uh, yes. answer the question? Let's ask the question. You want to ask the question? That means they got to put it into the chat right now. Do about yeah, that's Dr. Rock. We're going we're gonna to put the onus on you. Can you give us a question, Dr. Rock, while you're here, that, that our viewers need to answer in order to win this book? So you, in your presentation, something that you covered in your presentation, let's give you to, to put a question out there for them to answer. And listen, I'm, I'm going to stall for just a moment because if you're not in the Pastors Roundtable group, group on Facebook. Is that what we're doing? They won't have a chance. Yeah. They need to join the group. So yeah. I'm going to stall for another 30 seconds. You need to go and find Pastors Roundtable group. Oh, man. And they're going to say if they're not joining. Oh, that's too bad because we have to let them in the group. So if they're not in the group right now, they won't have hey, an opportunity. Listen, so that's, I'm, I'm gonna just our, say that's too bad. You should have joined the hey, group. Look, the arc, so the arc door is closed, man. Arc it's is closed. closed. <laughs> so it's only for those of you who are currently a part of the group um, that you'll have opportunity to win this book. All right, so doctor, you, you got your question, Dr. Rock? Yes, I do. All right, here we go. The question is, the question is, what is the two word expression that Ooh, I know what it is. Early Adventists use in order to keep black people out of their meetings and institutions. Two words. Uh, one go. expression, two words. I got right. it, but let's go. Don't if you type it in this chat, wherever you are, that's great, <laughs> that's wonderful, that's lovely. Oh. But it needs to be in the group chat on Facebook. Not in oh, if you're on okay. YouTube. It does it doesn't okay. count if it's on YouTube. It doesn't count if it's on the page that we're streaming to in Facebook. You've got to go. If you're a member of Pastors Roundtable Group, you've got to go to the group page and post your answer there. I see people trying to put stuff in there right now. It needs to go in the group. All right. Well, We'll have a go at and, that. And, and if you have more than three and you need a few more, let me know. I'll get you a few more. I'll, I'll, I'll donate them to you. Oh, Bless awesome. That is such an awesome thing. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Rock. I believe that our people are going to be edified um, and educated um, with this work that you have done. Um, uh, Dr. Henry, uh, before uh, uh, Pastor Wade take, takes us out, is there anything else you want to share uh, before we leave. Oh, I want to give a special shout out to, to Bishop Donald Oliver. Um, and I know this has been a very interesting uh, conversation for him, and I wish we had had time to talk about how this plays out in other denominations. But Bishop, we're glad to see you with us today. Yes. Um, he's joining us from, from Orangeburg, uh, I think it's Orangeburg, South Carolina. Um, glad to have you with us. Dr. Henry, uh, before we pass it to uh, Dr. Wade to take us out. Listen, listen, um, man, you're taking a risk passing it to me, Pastor Paul, because I have so many questions. And Dr. Rock, I want to officially invite you back um, because I, I just want you to come back and answer some of these questions. For example, uh, the, the racial uh, tension and the racial problems, are they still prevalent today within our division, the General Conference, our hospital system? Mm -hmm. And if so, 
what should we do so that we can march and and blow the mantle of equality I, you don't don't have to answer it now but that's where i'm going what can we do do we just sit around and or what can we do to say listen we need to do something so that we are represented in these different areas of our church but Go ahead, Pastor Wade. I, I know I have more. Pastor Wade, let them know. Let the folk know there's a difference between the Pastors Roundtable page and the Pastors Roundtable group. I'm seeing a whole lot of answers. I, I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't very clear on that. But you cleared that up for them. Well, yes, there is a group. A group is a smaller. It's a small, intimate group that we have been asking you to join. You want. You need to join the group. But there is a group of them already. Group of uh, viewers already in the group. And if you can go into the group and put your answer there, that would be great. And, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of questions from the YouTube side. What about the YouTube side? Yeah. Join the group. Join <laughs> the group. Join the group. And we will we will get with you this week on the answers and we will get your gift to you. I Again, see thank you. Rock for GC president in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Rock, for being with us. You just don't know how you have blessed us. We actually we never got to any of our questions None because of you you dropped some knowledge and uh, the folks in the okay. chat, they brought their questions and it was just a wonderful experience. So, Dr. Rock, thank you so much. We'll be praying for you. And if there's anything we can do here at the Pastors Roundtable to help you get the message out, do not hesitate to let us know. We'll be happy to lock arms with you and together let the world know about what, what being Jesus the Radical is really about. Yes. So here at the Pastors Roundtable, we're just so excited that we can join together to aid in our aim to keep ministry relevant, resourced, and real. God bless. Thank you.